Good morning. Good evening. us from Africa, the United States, Europe, and other parts of the world. My name is Monde Muyangoa, and I am the director of the Africa program at the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center, through its Africa program and environmental change and security, is honored African Union. United States Department of State to host this very important discussion on Africa's policy priorities for food security and nutrition. Wilson Center issues facing Africa and US-Africa relations to build mutually beneficial US-Africa relations and to enhance knowledge and understanding about Africa in the United States. Today, all of those goals as you all know, the Africa Union has declared 2022 as a year of food security and nutrition for the continent. And over the years, we have seen Africa increase food security and nutrition under the comprehensive program. Remain. These include the impact of international and regional conflicts, climate change, the ongoing and ever evolving COVID pandemic, all of which reinforce the need for even stronger approaches and measures to mitigate food insecurity and, and malnutrition. As these issues, today's events will food security strengthening to increase, sorry, the first one will fo focus on food security, system strengthening to increase food production, trade and sustainability. And the second one will focus on nutrition smart programs but we have for incredible to these issues to kick off our event today by framing and highlighting some of the key issues that our panelists will discuss in uh, panel one and panel two. And to officially open, I'd like to introduce President and CEO of the Wilson Center. He has a long and distinguished career, including serving as president of the McCain Institute President of the International Republican Institute and as administrator of USAID from 2017 to 2020, which all of you know is at the forefront of food security and its engagement with other parts of the world. With that, let me turn it over to Ambassador Mark Green uh, so he can uh, open the event and introduce our other special guest uh, to open our, our session today. Ambassador Green. Great, thanks, Monday, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. As you've just heard from Monday, I am uh, Mark Green, Ambassador Green, and it is my great honor to welcome all of you to this important and, quite frankly, uh, very urgently needed discussion. I offer a special thanks to both the African Union Commission and the State Department for their partnership and support and, and for their willingness to share their respective visions for food security in Africa. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Wilson Center, we're really unique in the community of think tanks and policy institutes. We were officially established by Congress five decades ago for, in their words, strengthening the world of learning and the world of public affairs. While many centers deal in data and information, we've been asked by Congress to go further into scholarship and learning. So our currency is knowledge, our focus is independent analysis, and our purpose is developing options and recommendations that decision makers can believe in, and we are fiercely nonpartisan. You just heard from Monday a description of the great work our Africa program does. Our environmental change and security program is also a cutting edge program, really looking at the interplay between human activity, uh, climate extremes, and what the collateral damage and consequences are in Africa, but all around the world. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is really as important to the countries and peoples of Africa as any other. As you heard, the African Union has declared 2022 to be the year of nutrition and food security. It has announced the goal of increasing the continent's resilience and strengthening food systems and accelerating human development. So in one way, that designation makes perfect sense because African countries have made real progress in these fronts especially in the last 20 years. But it also makes sense because it raises awareness at a crucial moment. Current challenges, including conflicts in Africa and elsewhere, increasing climate extremes, 
and the pandemic, of course, are really making this mission more difficult and especially important. Putin's war on Ukraine has led to the diversion of wheat and other grains, a dramatic reduction in the availability of fertilizers and other key tools, and upward pressure on consumer prices. And so for those of us who care deeply about Africa and about food security, we have to look beyond the headlines. It isn't simply what's happening today in terms of, of hunger and malnutrition. It's also thinking about the long-term ramifications, uh, the missed growing seasons, the lack of those tools and interventions that have made so much progress in recent years. Like never before, we're going to need continent-wide approaches and enhanced U.S. support for Africa-led strategies and priorities. As an American, I'm truly proud that the U.S. government recognizes these challenges and is bringing to bear its resources to face them. USAID, as, as you all know, has invoked emergency authorities to tap into more than $280 million in funding from the Bill Emerson Humanitarian Trust, and that will bolster emergency food operations, including in five African countries. And next week, the U.S. will convene a Security Council debate to discuss issues of conflict and food security. Today, we will hear from our guests from the African Union. We will also hear from Cindy McCain talking about her views from Rome, what she sees. We will hear a lot about what the AU and member states have done in terms of the progress they've made, but just as importantly, their policy priorities and the areas for U.S. AU cooperation in the months ahead. The response remarks from our guests from USAID, my friend Jim Barnhart, assistant to the administrator in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and Mr. Jason Haffemeister, acting deputy undersecretary for trade and foreign agricultural affairs at the USDA, will facilitate this dialogue between the US and the AU. But before that, we are honored to have another friend of mine someone I truly admire, Ambassador Cindy McCain. Cindy's joining us from her office in Rome where she's leading U.S. engagement to international organizations, including the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Food Program, and IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Ambassador McCain was sworn in to serve as the U.S. Ambassador to the UN agencies in Rome on November 5th, 2021. It's just the latest chapter in a career of that has been dedicated to improving the lives of the less fortunate, both in the US and around the world. She's the former chair of the board of trustees of the McCain Institute and chair of the Institute's Human Trafficking Advisory Council. She brings a remarkable dedication to lifting lives and she combines it with a, a great career of business acumen and making a real difference. So with that, uh, welcome Ambassador McCain and. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mark. And I, I really appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity to be here today with all of you during the African Union's Year of Nutrition and Food Security. I'm honored to open the discussion between the United States and the African Union on one of the most pressing issues we face today, food security. I often say that food security is the central issue we must grapple with. It's the link between all the other great global challenges we face, from climate change to the pandemic to the catastrophe Russia has unleashed on, on Ukraine. African ownership of, food system, of the food system's challenges and opportunities on the continent is essential. The United States is focusing on helping meet short-term short food and nutrition needs while also engaging with the African Union, its regional economic communities, and member states on longer term food systems transformation. The critical, this critical period demands our attention and focus. And I can tell you with certainty, the crisis we are facing because of the unilateral conflict against Ukraine is immense and far reaching. And innocent people are going to pay the heaviest price. I recently was in Kenya and Madagascar, and I saw firsthand some extreme vulner extremely vulnerable communities that will suffer even more because of soaring food and fertilizer prices, limited stable food supplies, and forced cuts to humanitarian rations. 
this unprecedented aggression hit the breadbasket of the world, a world that's still reeling from COVID, extreme droughts, conflicts, and other emergencies. The United States is aligning our efforts with the African Union's continental climate and comprehensive agricultural development strategies that include transforming food systems as a priority while ensuring inclusive participation of marginalized and vulnerable groups, especially women and youth. To many of these, emerg to many of these emergencies, they affect the African continent and it's worsening. It's, it, it, these situations are already very difficult. As you know, I represent the United States with the UN food agencies in Rome. And I can tell you that I'm working to fulfill our role here in Rome on supporting Africa's efforts to boost its humanitarian, economic, environmental, and social goals for food and nutrition. Our attention right now is focused on mitigating the global effects, including in Africa, of higher food and fertilizer prices and shortages caused by this senseless conflict. Together with partners around the globe, World Food Program, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development, we are delivering critical life-saving developmental assistance to those who need it most. At the same time, the US has been pouring resources into immediate humanitarian assistance and broader strategies to bolster food security. The WFP has been doing what they do the best, leading an efficient and effective humanitarian response. At the same time, the United States has called on FAO to draw on its technical expertise to keep agriculture from collapsing in Ukraine, with the obvious global effects such that a collapse would create. I know how closely countries in Africa work with FAO, a strategic partner of the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program since 2003. And we are working with EFAD to bring its financing tools to bear, protecting the livelihoods of small holders. These, these three agencies work to address immediate needs while planning for longer term will be essential in helping the countries most affected to adjust. We are doing everything we can to help support trade and ensure imported food remains available in vulnerable countries amid rising prices, including working with the African Development Bank to help agribusiness import the food and commodities they need. We are trying desperately to free ships laden with food and goods destined for hungry citizens in Africa that are stuck in the Black Sea because of Russia's war in Ukraine. We are also working to incentivize more global fertilization production. As, as you well know, global fertilizer supply is also disrupted and key input prices are rising. The United States Department of Agriculture has announced a $250 million grant program to boost fertilized production at home, and we urge other countries to take similar measures where possible. But while we must focus on the immediate demands of the crisis at hand, we know the next emergency is right around the corner. Our global food system is vulnerable and in desperate need of a long lasting foundation for its future. That's why the United States is dedicating its presidency of the UN Security Council this month to food security. Secretary Blinken is hosting the Global Food Security Call to Action, a ministerial on May 18th at the UN headquarters in New York to work with partners across the globe to, among other objectives, mobilize resources for the WFP, UNICEF, and other UN organizations on the front lines of this global crisis caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Secretary Blinken will also host a UN Security Council debate the following day on the impacts of conflict on global food security, featuring heads of essential international organizations. The ministerial will aim to shed more light on the Ukraine crisis and mobilize resources but more importantly, it aims to promote commitment to medium and long-term strategies to lay the groundwork for sustained action to bolster global food security and resilience. 
we need to invest long-term in food security because the fact is everything else depends on it. We can't have a discussion about climate change or sustainable development or war and not talk about the many millions of people around the world who don't know where their next meal will come from, who don't know if their fields will ever yield enough produce, who don't know if their communities will ever be able to thrive again, or if the next conflict or the next drought will push them over the brink. If we're going to address any of these world's greatest challenges, we must invest first in the tools and frameworks that will help achieve lasting food security in Africa and beyond. We can start by making sure that we integrate science-backed, sustainable productivity growth into every approach from biotechnology to agroecology. The key to success will be finding innovative ways to do more with less. We also have to be willing to reach for all the proverbial tools in the toolbox. That includes embracing creative partnerships and the expertise of the private sector, such as with the World Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate. Just one of the examples of the strengthening partnerships with academic institutions, research groups, and governments, and believing in the power of technology and science to help us meet our greatest challenges, whether it's adapting to climate change, strengthening crop production, or boosting nutrition. As the AU vision this year of nutrition and food security has made clear, African voices from every sector and every walk of life, from rural farmers to women community leaders to young people who are the future of agriculture will be essential to building the food systems we envision for today, tomorrow, and beyond. This has been the approach of African leaders in civil society for the last two decades. This time for an even greater focus is now. We need food systems that are agile in the face of threats and responsive to community needs, productive and sustainable. And most of all, food systems that can serve as the foundation of vibrant, thriving communities in Africa and around the globe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador McCain and Ambassador Green for getting us off to such a great start. I think you have done a really uh, great job in terms of really outlining the challenges that confront us uh, with regard to food security and, and nutrition, talking about the scale and scope of the problem, uh, but also looking to what already exists and how we can build on that looking at the contours and the pillars of a strategic approach to address these two issues in both the short term and the long term, looking at some of the developments on the African continent, but and also internationally and how we can bring those together to better address these issues. So thank you so much, uh, really great start. And we appreciate you uh, just laying out the issues that we will be addressing uh, in the next two panels. So please join me uh, in uh, thanking Ambassador Green and Ambassador McCain for uh, the great start to this event. Uh, could I now ask the, pan uh, the panelists, the speakers for the first panel on food security, system strengthening to increase production, trade and sustainability to please turn on your cameras. Uh, could I ask the chair to turn on the camera as well? Fantastic. Thank you. So the goal of this first panel is to uh, assess the African Union and member states' efforts to address food uh, production and develop effective uh, food systems to support trade and sustainability, to highlight the African Union's policy priorities, and to identify areas for USA African Union cooperation on food security, including the US government's assistance to food uh, security strategies. We have two speakers and a chair for, for this session. Uh, their speakers will first offer their remarks and after both have spoken, we will have a discussion and a Q&A which will be led by our chair. 
We are live tweeting today's event and taking questions online. If you would like to join the discussion or ask a question, please tweet us by tagging at Africa Up Close using the hashtags food security and year of nutrition or by using the chat function below on the event webpage. The Wilson Center team will be monitoring the chat box for your questions. If you want to ask a question, we ask that you please provide us with your name, your organizational affiliation, if any, and the speaker to whom you'll be addressing the question. This will allow us to accurately convey your questions to the chair, who in turn will engage uh, the speakers on those uh, questions. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers and the chair for this session. And in the interest of preserving as much time as possible for presentations and discussion, I will give only the top line uh, introductions. Their full bios can be found on the Wilson Center website. Our first speaker for this session will be Her Excellency Josefa Sacco. She is a Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Sustainable Environment at the African Union Commission. She will be followed by Dr. Jim Barnhart, the Assistant to the Administrator, USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and the Deputy Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future, the US government's Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative. And our chair for this session is Dr. Carrie Fowler, who is a Special Envoy for Food for Global Food Security at the US Department of State. He has also twice served as, twice served as Special Assistant to the Secretary General of the Wood with the World Food Summit. So we're really looking forward to this uh, uh, session. Uh, unfortunately, due to a last minute development, Ambassador Sacco is unable to join us live, but she has sent us a videotaped remarks. And so with that, can I ask my colleagues at the Wilson Center to please roll the tape? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are located. I bring you greetings from His Excellency, Musa Faki Mohammed the chairperson of the African Union Commission. It is my pleasure to join you all today for the high-level event on nutrition and food security. As you may know, the African Union team for 2020 is on building resilience for nutrition and food security. Today's event is organized in the context of the African Union Team of the Year. I would like to thank our partners on the U.S. side for working with us to organize this event. This is a sign of a strong relationship and collaboration and various U.S. government agencies, in particular the U.S. Agency for International Development, the USAID, and the U.S. Department for Agriculture, USDAR. USID has been a long-term partner in the implementation of the comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program known as CADEP. Since its adoption in Maputo, Mozambique in 2003, that is of 19 years of partnership and collaboration with the USID on CADEP. USDAR has also been our partner for many years, especially supporting our work on livestock development through the African Union AU IBER Bureau for Animal Resources. Most recently, we have worked together to advance food safety and plant health. This collaboration led to the development of three continental policy framework the African Union Sanitary and Phytosanitary Policy Framework, the African Union Food Safety Strategy, and the African Union Plant Health Strategy. All these frameworks have been endorsed by the African Union member states in their implementation as stated. I look forward to strengthening our existing collaboration and broadening our partnership to new areas such as nutrition, agribusiness development, post-harvest management, and food fortification, among others. In addition 
to the direct support of the U.S. government agency to my department, the African Union Commission also receives indirect support from other partners' organizations that are partly funded the US, by the U.S. governments. Such partners include the International Food Policy Research Institute, Academia 2063, the Alliance for Green Revolution Agra, Policy Links, among others. We are grateful for these support as well. Today's event focusing on food security and nutrition is timely. Africa is facing a good security and nutrition crisis brought about for four consecutive shocks to our food system. The shocks include the fall armyworm from in 2018 and 2019, the desert locusts the, on, on the horn of uh, Africa 2019-2020, the COVID-19 pandemic since 2020, 2020 and the ongoing Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. The four shocks are on top the, the, to the impact of climate change on Africa's food system, particularly prolonged the drought and floods. The shocks and impact of food system have exposed Africa vulnerability, but also reveal opportunity for Africa to address the core systemic challenges to ensuring food and nutrition security on the continent. Why we may not predict any, with any pre uh, precision the occurrence of the next shock, we are pretty sure that there will be future shocks to Africa food system. Therefore, our uh, strategy is not to run after uh, each shock as it comes. We want to co concentrate our effort in building food system that are strong enough to withstand future shocks. This means building resilient food system in Africa in line with the team of 2020. As such, we have five priority areas of which I will briefly highlight. The first is increased food production, especially of staple foods. Africa is a net food importer to the tone, tone of uh, 45 billion US dollars. By increasing food production, this money will be safe and will go to our small scale food producers across the continent. Our aspiration for food sovereignty is not at odds with promoting trade with the rest of the world. We aspire to have uh, enough food to feed our, uh, our people and to expose them to e erratic food markets that have proved unreliable in the, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic and the U Russia and the Ukraine conflict. To boost food production will require addressing the system, systemic constraints at farm level, low yield crop variety, declined soil fertility, land tenure secure, secure, water scarcity, among others. The second is reducing the post-harvest food loss that have been estimated at 20 to 30 percent for some crops such as maize. By reducing post-harvest loss, we will not only make sure food available to consumer, but also reduce on the carbon uh, footprint in producing this food in the first instance. Invest, investment are needed in aff affordable post-harvest handling and storage facility for small-scale farmers. Investment are also needed in cold storage and transportation, especially for perishable foods such as fruit, and vegetable, fish, meat, and milk. We are promoting agro-process and having developed 
the Africa, the common African agro parks known as a, a, a CAP, mean to key developed transboundary agricultural value chain. The third is investing in climate smart agriculture. Africa is uh, negatively impacted by the climate change, even though it is the least emitter of the greenhouse gas emission. We need to increase investment in agricultural research to produce climate smart technology for farmers. We also want to increase investment in agricultural extension services to ensure that the technology development reach our farmers. The fourth is uh, promoting the intra-African trade in agri agriculture, food and services. As you may be aware, Africa, the African Continental Free Trade Area became operational in, Jan in, uh, in uh, January 2021. This is an opportunity for Africa to use trade as a means of ensuring food security by facilitating movement of food from supply to deficit part of the continent. These were, these were our collaborative work on food standard and food sef uh, safety will make a difference. We are also in the process of establishing an African, uh, an, an African food safety agency and we welcome the opportunity to learn some best practices from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Perhaps a change in visit could be arranged for our technical experts to learn from the FDA experience. Finally, priority is strengthening mutual accountability through the CADEP annual review mechanism. Every two years, the African Union Commission and the NEPAD, in collaboration with Regional Economic Work Committee, our RECs, produce and present a report to African Union head of state and government on the progress that African Union member states are making in implementation of the CADEP commitment in the Malabo Declaration. The biannual review report has now become the reference document on tracking the progress of agricultural transformation in Africa. The report contains countries and regional profile that shows detailed performance of a country or a region economic community against the seven CADEP Malabo commitment. We encourage our partner to use this report as the starting point for engagement with me our member states to identify areas that need attention in order to transform food system. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to end my remark by reiterating, reiterating my commitment to strengthen further the relationship between my department with various U.S. government agency and also explore building functional relationship with the U.S. private sector and civil society organization that operate in the, Africa, in the agricultural space. I want to thank the U.S. State Department and the U.S. Mission in Addis for working with the African Union departments to organize this event. I look forward to learning more during the discussion. I thank you very much for your kind attention. Muito obrigada, shukran, merci beaucoup, muchas gracias, asante sana. Thank you so much to Ambassador Sacco, um, Commissioner Sacco. Uh, Dr. Godfrey Bahigua will be standing in for her in the Q&A period. And so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Bernhardt and then turn it over to our chair to pick things up right after Dr. Bernhardt has spoken. Dr. Bernhardt. Uh, thank you very much, Monde, and a deep appreciation to the Wilson Center, the African Union, and the State Department, you know, Ambassador Sacco, and, and Commissioner uh, Samante, and, and, and all the others who were so instrumental in, in holding this in critically uh, important discussion today. Look, I think despite decades of progress, millions of Africans still face hunger 
and malnutrition that's been exacerbated the last three years by COVID-19, by increasing conflict that we're seeing regionally uh, across the continent, and then growing threat of climate change um, in the Horn of Africa and, and in West Africa. And now we have Russia's aggression on, on Ukraine. Uh, this unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine is driving up prices for food and fertilizer everywhere, and it's increasing suffering and hardship for millions of people in Africa and across the globe. So we are most concerned about countries that are at, at high risk of food insecurity due to the global impacts of the war in Ukraine and those that are less directly exposed but highly vulnerable. Um, this latter group reflects a context where even a small additional shock could have outsized impacts, especially given COVID-19 effects on, on poverty, hunger, malnutrition, ongoing humanitarian emergencies, and food and fertilizer prices that were already high even before Russia invaded Ukraine. So countries of immediate concern with existing crises um, of acute food and insecurity include Afghanistan, Yemen, and, and the Horn of Africa. You know, available estimates suggested up to 40 million additional people, many in Africa, could be pushed into poverty and food insecurity in 2022. And that's by the war in, in Ukraine and its, its secondary effects. And despite these challenges, um, we applaud the African Union in boldly declaring this to be the year of nutrition and food security for the continent. You know, we know that agriculture as a we know that ag agriculture is a drive of, of, of economic growth has the strongest potential to achieve to achieve food security in Africa and effective policies can go a long way toward realizing this potential. We also know that a productive and resilient agriculture sector can help to blunt the effects of climate, uh, climate change, geopolitical and other shocks. But to achieve food systems transformation in Africa, we need inclusive and evidence-based policy, policy decisions. They, th those will accelerate agriculture-led growth and ensure the gains from this growth are sustainable and benefit those marginalized populations most affected by food insecurity and malnutrition. The U.S. is committed to ending hunger and malnutrition and to building sustainable, resilient food systems. Um, we, the government of the United States, intends to invest $5 billion over the next five years through Feed the Future for global food security and nutrition. You know, Feed, Feed the Future is the U.S. government's initiative to combat hunger and, and malnutrition involves the entire um, breadth and depth of U.S. resources and expertise across the federal government. And it's, it is designed to combat global hunger and poverty at, at the root, at their very root um, causes, such as, you know, uh, that, that then drive the, the poverty, hunger, and malnutrition. And it focuses on over 35 countries. The investments that we're going to put through Feed the Future it will promote inclusive agriculture-led growth, improve access to safe, nutritious food, including through food fortification, reduce food lo loss and waste, and support climate-smart agriculture in, in Africa and, the and around the world. The United States also announced this past year the intention to invest up to $11 billion to address global malnutrition, and that's over the next three years. And we did that at the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit um, last fall. And our policy commitments align strongly with the African Union priorities. And we were pleased to see so many commitments from other partner governments across Africa. So building on this momentum, USA remains committed to supporting Africa's agriculture transformation. We see Africa as a key partner in promoting global food security and, cli and climate, climate adaptation and mitigation and climate and conflict resilience. We particularly commend the African Union's leadership in advancing the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, as we call it, CADAP, um, and, and its implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, both of which have the potential to unlock Africa's agriculture potential while reducing hunger, malnutrition, and poverty. We applaud Commissioner Sacco and the third biennial review recently held, which highlights Africa's accountability to transparency in its product, in its progress toward the CAD of objectives. And we recognize support the, and we recognize and support the progress the African Union and African heads of state have made in setting and championing policy agendas to address food security challenges that spur inclusive growth on the continent.
Now, support for, for CADEP reflects our longstanding and successful partnership with the AU, and a partnership that has persisted through political transitions, changing priorities, and remains a testament to our shared commitment to Africa's progress. At the same time, we recognize that not all countries have fully embraced CADEP, and that many countries have not addressed weaknesses identified in the biennial review process, and that most countries are behind schedule for achieving the Malabo commitments. So accelerating progress toward these commitments is among the highest priorities of USAID. And I know that we share this priority with the African Union Commission and its member states. And we want to see countries using the biennial review data to inform inclusive evidence-based policy and investment decisions. And in alignment with the, the Biden-Harris administration's focus on climate change, USAID recently launched an, a, an agency climate strategy that will set forth objectives and guide the work of partner countries to adapt to and lessen the effects of climate change. We're also committed to addressing the worst effects of climate change and promoting resilience. We're pleased to partner with you and member states through the, through the Comprehensive Africa Climate Change Initiative, or CASI, on the implementation of the nationally determined contributions and the nationally, national adaptation plans. Those will be addressing um, climate-induced challenges. We will also be deploying and funding technical assistance toward new, new activities that mobilize finance for climate adaptation and mitigation and disaster risk preparedness in partnership with country governments and the private sector. But the gains in, in food security over the past decade have been eroded over the last few years. And we're alarmed by the dire situation in the Horn of Africa and in West Africa. Russia's war on Ukraine is contributing to this reversal. We're listening to what the African Union, its member states, and our missions are reporting on a country level um, on the effects, and, and we are then focusing our efforts toward policies and programs to increase access to inputs needed to produce food and purchase agriculture um, inputs and, and food at affordable prices. So in support of your vision, Feed the Future activities that help buffer food systems against macroeconomic shocks like the invasion of Ukraine, um, are, include increasing the productivity of smallholder farmers, including women, through the access to, uh, to improved agriculture technologies and inputs, financing and markets, strengthening agriculture market systems by building a vibrant um, private sector, and improving people's access to, to higher quality diets and safer food for improved nutrition. I sit on the agency's Nutrition Leadership Council, and we recently updated our, our nutrition priority and strategic support countries. 13 of these 18 countries are in Africa, demonstrating how strongly we are supporting the African Union's nutrition agenda. So as we work to support the African Union and African countries to tackle food security and nutrition challenges, we look forward to a continued partnership with the African Union and African leaders to advance inclusive, sustainable, and resilient systems transformation across Africa. So thank you again, Wilson Center and African Union and State Department for hosting this important discussion, and I will yield my time to the moderator. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and for some of you, maybe even good evening. Um, You've all heard the presentations of Ambassadors Green and McCain, and now the presentations from Commissioner Sacco and my friend Jim Barnhart at USAID. Um, each one of them has emphasized the, the triple threats that are being posed to agriculture today from climate, from COVID, uh, and from conflict. Uh, several have mentioned uh, impending and present uh, fertilizer shortages. We could add to that uh, issues with water, water availability and such. So uh, when you add all that up, I think you, you have to conclude that uh, agriculture is, is facing a, an historically unprecedented uh, combination of challenges. There's much to discuss today. Uh, I'd like to start by just encouraging everyone to forward their questions to us. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so um, if you get your questions in quickly, they will be higher in the queue. Uh, so please do that. We want to, to foster a, a dialogue. Um, we're, we're among friends today. We're among allies in this struggle to create global food security. And in that context, um, and in the larger one, I, I want to start off with a with a question that's um, 
a bit a bit provocative and pointed, and and that is, what do what do we um, who are not in Africa not yet understand about uh, food systems in Africa in the current situation, in the current situation of climate change, COVID conflict? Uh, what do we who are not there on the ground not understand that we need to understand in order to be better partners? And how can we be better partners? I see uh, Dr. Godfrey Fahikwa there and I'm gonna put him on the spot and see if he wants to respond. Yeah, um, yeah. thank you, uh, Dr. Fowler, uh, for, for that question. It is uh, indeed uh, quite provocative. Um, I think I'll build on uh, um, Ambassador Sacco's uh, remarks um, that it is high time now we concentrate on building um, resilient food systems that will withstand current and future shocks. That is really the key message um, that delivered by Commissioner Sacco in her remarks. And to be able to do that, she has emphasized the need to address the systemic constraints that limit food production on this continent. This continent has produced enough food to feed its people. And of course, it is a, a, a large continent with diverse agroecologies. Uh, and therefore, what we need to appreciate is that diversity across the continent. And as, as, as we engage with different countries across the continent, with the regional economic communities, it is important to appreciate that diversity. And that diversity means you, you cannot have common solutions across all African countries. They have to be context specific. They have to be agroecological uh, um, uh, uh, conditions to be taken into account. And so that is really the, 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 the short uh, answer to your question that as we partner with the uh, various US government agencies, let's keep in mind that Africa is diverse and let's uh, engage uh, based on the, uh, those dynamics across different countries, informed, as Commissioner Sako said, by the Kadabanyo Review Report, which has country profiles that show where the constraints are to transforming their food systems. Um, and those reflect the realities on the ground. So let's engage along those lines in order to address um, the constraints limiting food production on the continent. Over. Carrie, hey, you you for some reason your your audio is a little scratchy. I, I think the question, if let me just try repeating it and then Godfrey and I can take turns answering. But if I've heard you correctly, you were asking what are some common kinds of interventions that we could be making in Africa to address the um the the current crisis, but also thinking about climate change and such? Is that yes? Okay. Um, well, I, Godfrey, if it's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and then you can follow, follow up. Um, so one of the things I think that came out of the biennial review um, was the, the need to, to do, I think, two important um, bits of in, increased investment in, in Africa by African, both African states, but also with partners, um, is number one, looking at investments in research, um, particularly on um, building um, and working through um, African-based um, research institutions, um, universities, research centers across the continent. As, as Godfrey says, each area has a different set of, of, of climate um, of parameters, different soil conditions, et cetera. And so 
making sure that there's a dispersed set of, of research, um, uh, um, high, you know, top quality research entities that are addressing those specific constraints and, and changes that, they're, that those countries and regions are facing um, from climate change, I think is, inc is a critically important. And, and we're doing quite a bit of that through Feed the Future and our, our innovation lab partnerships that we're, we're doing and working through the CGs, but there's more that can be done there. And I think also putting more into the national um, uh, NARS, the, the research centers around the continent is really critical. So that would be one. And then the other thing I think it would be increased um, in investments on extension services. You know, um, making sure that smallholder farmers um, have access to this cutting edge um, research, to the best quality seeds, to the to ideas on how they can do um, use fertilizer more sustainably, use smaller amounts, but in, in greater um, but with greater effect. And there is there's really good science behind the sustainable intensification of fertilizer. And with the prices of fertilizer being so high, getting more. Um, per gram of fertilizer out of that in terms of yield, I think would go a long way to supporting smallholder farmer productivity and, and, and income. So I'll, I'll, those are just two quick ideas and I'll pass to Godfrey. I'm sure he's got a dozen better ones. Well, I, I, and I want to agree with you, Jim, uh, on the two points um, on investing in research to generate climate smart technologies and not just research alone, but also ensuring that these technologies actually reach farmers through strong extension systems. I do endorse those two points. Um, perhaps I could add um, one more, uh, and that is, uh, as again emphasized by Commissioner Sako in her, in her statement, um, post-harvest food uh, loss management. Anywhere between 20 and 30% uh, of food that is produced depending on which value chain it is, is lost after it is produced by the farmers. And as we are emphasizing increasing food, food production and productivity, we also need to emphasize that what is produced should be saved um, and, and made available to, to consumers. So post-harvest food loss management is another key priority uh, that, and we see that across the continent, across different value chains, whether it is in the vegetable sector, the meat sector, the fruits subsectors, there is a lot of food loss and this can be saved. And in the process, you, uh, you save on, on the cost of food production and that food becomes available to, uh, to consumers. And we observe that across the continent. The, the, th the fourth one I could add um, is again on improving food safety. And not just for the sake of um, consumers, which is very important, but also in support of uh, a trade um, across, across the continent. And safe food will limit the benefits that we expect to get out of the Africa continental free trade area. So our investments and collaboration around improving food safety on the continent is important, both for consumers as well as for boosting intra-Africa trade in food. Uh, if I can go first, Jim. Uh, yes. So there are there are several opportunities that um, that are there, uh, and some of them already we are cooperating with uh, various U.S. Uh, government agencies. Um, as Commissioner Sako indicated in her statement, we have strong collaboration with USDA, especially on our work on um, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, standards. We collaborated in the formulation of the Africa Food Safety uh, Strategy and the Africa Plant Health Strategy and continuing with our collaboration to support the implementation of those strategies. So these are concrete uh, deliverables that we have, um, that we have between uh, the AU and, and the USDA. We have also, again, emphasizing Commissioner Sako's point 
or especially on the policy front, the support that we have received over the years from U, uh, USID. Now, taking that uh, a, a one level lower, we need to, um, uh, to start thinking about uh, science, the benefits of, of science. And I, I think uh, Ambassador McCain made this point. Let's take advantage of the benefits of science. And um, the US is quite advanced in, these, uh, in a lot of these areas. And so we should think about uh, how to uh, take advantage of uh, what the US private sector and uh, Commissioner Sacco emphasized this, that beyond um, the collaboration we have with USD and USID, let's also explore how we can strengthen our partnership with the private sector in the US agriculture, uh, as well as civil society. Because in the private sector lies the cutting edge technologies, especially biosciences that could uh, help Africa advance quickly its productivity. So we need to have that, that discussion uh, going forward. But also, uh, again, as Commissioner Sacco emphasized on our work on food safety, we stand ready to learn from the, food, uh, the US Food and Drug Administration, the best practices that you have that we could copy um, and apply within our context um, uh, to, to advance the work of food safety uh, in Africa. Over. So I have a moment, Gary, before I end over, we're, we're, we're very tight on time, but just to, to I table thump everything Godfrey said, I agree 100% with that. And I think there's some really good partnerships there. Um, last month, I, I was in um, Senegal and I, and I visited a farm that was being, that was founded and run and the, everyone working with it was under the age of 35. And it was really quite startling to see these young people who were, were so excited about agriculture. And I think part of it was they were trying new tools and, and, and accessing digital technology um, phones for marketing, for, for trying to keep up with the, the latest in terms of, 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 of both weather and, and other types of um, uh, kind of key in, types of, of information they needed to, to run their business. And I think that kind of access, pulling in digital technology, pulling in the latest and uh, 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 how you do that kind of marketing, I think is a way to make the sector far more attractive to young people. And we can, I think we can, we can continue to build on that. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fowler. I appreciate you chairing this uh, session. And to our viewers, we apologize for a little bit of the, um, the, the connectivity and sound issues that we had there, but I think we were able to get uh, Dr. Fowler's questions and our speakers did an excellent job of speaking to those. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fowler, for joining us and for chairing uh, this, this session. Let me now uh, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Allison uh, Grunder, who is uh, Associate Director of the Africa Program, but also a Senior Diplomatic Fellow at the Wilson Center on Detail from the Department of State. Allison, over to you for the next panel. Thank you so much, Mandy, and also thank you to Her Excellency uh, Ambassador Sacco, Dr. Barnhart, um, Dr. Bahigwa, and Dr. Fowler for that excellent uh, discussion. Um, it is my honor to introduce our second panel, um, the nu Nutrition Smart Progress Critical Interventions. The goal of this panel is to assess the current state of nutrition in Africa and consider ways to accelerate progress on nutrition, including through USAU cooperation, adequate financing, increased implementation capacity, and coordination efforts. As a reminder, we are live tweeting today's event and taking questions online. To join the discussion or ask a question, please tweet us by tagging at Africa up close using the hashtags food security and year of nutrition or by using the chat function on the event webpage. 
uh, please be sure to type your name and affiliation before your question. So I will now introduce the panel. We are so fortunate to have Her Excellency Ambassador Minata Samate Sasuma, African Union Commissioner for Health, Humanitarian Affairs and Social Development with us today. Ambassador Samate is a career diplomat with over 30 years of distinguished service at the international, continental and regional level. We are also pleased to have with us today, Mr. Jason Hafemeister, Acting Deputy Undersecretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs and the Trade Council to the Secretary at the US Department of Agriculture. The chair of this session will be Dr. Godfrey Bahigwa, um, who is also stepping in um, to chair this session. Um, you saw him in the uh, earlier session as a, as a respondent. So uh, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Bahigwa, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Addison, uh, for, for this uh, um, introduction. And um, I'm happy to uh, take on the role as chair uh, for, the, for this panel. Um, we do have uh, two speakers uh, in, this, uh, in this panel. And the first one is Her Excellence Ambassador Sasuma Minata Samate, who is the Commissioner for Health, Humanitarian Affairs and Social Development at the African Union Commission. Your Excellence, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Director Bayigwa. Thank you, Madam Allison, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I would like to sincerely thank the Wilson uh, Center for organizing today important event and giving me the honor to deliver the remarks on Africa's policy priorities for food security and nutrition, and mainly on our continent uh, policy priorities. Your chosen theme is in line with the African Union theme of the year 2022 on nutrition. And uh, this theme represents uh, for us the cumulative policy decision that have been endorsed by our heads of state and government on the food security and nutrition in Africa. My remarks will mainly be on two aspects to complete what uh, Commissioner uh, Jose Pastaco has addressed. First, uh, what is the current state of nutrition on the continent? In 2014, the African Union Assembly adopted Malabo Declaration, which committed to end hunger and bring starting to 10% and uh, end their weight to 5% by the year 2025. While significant, significant progress has been achieved with only three years left, many member states are not on track to achieve these targets. For instance, on the continent we are facing undernourished, uh, more than one third of the world's undernourished people live in Africa. Uh, we have 282 uh, million in 2020, an increase of 46 million people as compared to 2019. This is based on the State of Food Security and Nutrition 2021 report. We have also healthy diets, in 2019, around 3 billion people were unable to afford a healthy diet, of which one out of three live in Africa. Uh, I can say 1 billion. We have also high prevalence of stunting. Between 2000 and 2020, the number of children with stunting in Africa increased from 54.4 million to 61 for uh, 0.4 million. We have also wasting prevalence, which is also high. One quarter of children, 27% affected by wasting globally lives in Africa. We have also anemia remains, which remain persistent, especially amongst women, adolescent girls, and young children. Overweight and obesity, also in Africa, 
in addition to existing underwork challenges, many countries in Africa are facing an increase in overweight and obesity associated with changing diets. In addition to existing challenges, we have uh, some uh, uh, person mentioned coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 pandemic are led to increase nutrition challenges, which in most member states reversed the gains which were made in the past. We now have a Russia Ukraine uh, crisis, which is having a significant impact on the food security and nutrition situation in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, my second point uh, of my uh, intervention is uh, will be uh, focused on priorities on nutrition. I mentioned uh, challenges, but to face these challenges described be, uh, above, we identified six policy priorities area for the team of the year 2022. First, strengthened data management and information system. Uh, you will all agree with me, without data, we cannot have good policies and uh, the African Union Commission is working with member states to ensure that data uh, is available and in timely manner to ensure better policies. We are working also with uh, our African Union Statistical uh, Institute. We have an institute on database in Tunisia on this regard. Second, we have increased investment in nutrition. African Union Commission we have a champion uh, and uh, African leaders for nutrition. They are working together with us also to advocate for increased commitment as well as mobilize domestic resources to finance nutrition. We have an uh, engagement of uh, our minister, ministers of finance. They have been uh, working to have key and the cause of anger in Africa studies I mentioned championed by the African Union and implemented now by 21 member states and the ministers of finance at national level uh, led the initiative. The study uh, linked the economic and social costs of a child and their nutrition, there highlighting the need for increased financing and multi-sectoral uh, coordination. We have also uh, a third one, third priority, enhanced partnership and improve institutional capacity. For that matter, we are working with uh, our institutions like uh, Auda Nepad, we are ADB, our regional economic communities. We have also bilateral and multilateral partners amongst other. Four, we have, we increase accountability for nutrition. Continental Accountability Scorecard launched in uh, 2019. This uh, uh, Continental uh, Scorecard allows for data on nutrition to be collected directly from uh, uh, our member state and encourage them to have national data system on nutrition. The African Union also has in, uh, in place uh, African Nutrition Report to track commitment made by member states and that will be launched this year, 2022, uh, as part of the implementation of the team of year. Five, we, we enable uh, environment to advance in the nutrition agenda. Prevention of malnutrition requires and enabling environment at the national level as well as at the community level. This includes, include among others safe water and sanitation, women's education and empowerment, and the quantity and quality of food available in our countries. The African Union and uh, partners are working to ensure that member states adopt and implement policies for nutrition that are multi-sectoral and these policies are in line with Africa regional nutrition strategy. Finally, 
let me appreciate the partnership between Africa and the United States. And this event is another opportunity for me personally to strengthen uh, USA and African Union engagement, and particularly with uh, US agencies like uh, USAID uh, on the critical issues of food security and nutrition. I look forward to fruitful deliberation and I thank you for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, uh, Excellence Commissioner Samate, for those uh, remarks. And now I would like to invite um, the response remarks by Mr. Jason Hafmeister, who is the Acting Deputy Under Secretary for Trade and Foreign Agricultural Affairs, uh, United States Department of Agriculture. Mr. Hafmeister, you have the floor. Great. Thank you very much, Godfrey. And thanks to Commissioners Samate and Sako for their leadership and that of the African Union Commission working with their member states to improve food security and nutrition in Africa. Uh, I, I would like to respond first by talking about some of the programmatic activities we have that we were collaborating with the African Union on, and then talk some more about some of the policy initiatives that we work together on. Uh, you know, nutrition is such a fundamental issue. It, it uh, drives human thriving and productivity and uh, so it's foundational to our work. It also is, of course, makes one hungry just thinking of it. So I'm happy to be here today. So uh, first, uh, you know, USDA is committed to supporting agricultural-led economic growth, uh, food security, nutrition, and open trade across Africa through the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, the CAADP. Both the United States and African Union joined the School Meals Coalition uh, that was created in the UN Food Systems Summit last year. And we are both members of its task force and its working group. This coalition was a priority commitment for us and one of the high level outcomes from the UN Food Systems Summit. The coalition's goals align with the AU Year of Nutrition and USDA's own international school feeding programs. Uh, we are looking forward to continued collaboration through this new platform with many countries, including those in Africa. Uh, just as a reminder, our McGovern Dole International Food for Education and Child Nutrition Program, which celebrates its 20th year this year, uh, is the largest international school feeding uh, program, making us the largest donor. And in 2022, we had an appropriation for global activity of $237 million. So we've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, we have over $200 million that we operate uh, in this program. Th this program's goals and its approaches align with the AU school nutrition goals and approaches. McGovern Dole supports post-government efforts to strengthen the enabling environment around school feeding by developing and refining policies, infrastructure, local and regional supply chains, and human capital. School feeding can reduce hunger for vulnerable children and their families. It can, the impacts of school feeding programs can extend to benefits for health and nutrition, uh, education, social protection, and local agricultural economic growth. All of these things can support the African Union goals under CAADP. We believe that in addition to the provision of food and school services, uh, increasing agricultural productivity is critical for alleviating poverty. And it also improves food security, nutrition, natural resource management, including the ability to adapt and be resilient to the realities of increasing extreme weather events like droughts uh, and other climate change manifestations. We believe agricultural transformation doesn't just benefit the farmer. We believe everybody stands to benefit. And so therefore we are appreciative of the participation from some African countries in uh, the Sustainable Productivity Growth Coalition, which was another institution that grew out of the UN Food Systems Summit. And its aim is to increase agricultural production in a way that is environmentally, economically, 
and socially sustainable. This uh, coalition, SPG, we call it for short, is composed of over 90 participating research organizations, academics, private sector companies, and countries, including Ghana, Liberia, Mauritania, and three African academic and research institutions, the Academy 2063, the Regional Universities Forum for Capacity Building in Africa, the RU Forum, and the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa, FARA, F-A-R-A. By leveraging evidence-based innovation and science, including biotechnology and other new technologies, we can expand the toolbox for farmers, ranchers, fishermen, and other producers to increase their incomes, to improve food affordability, and the sustainability and resilience of food systems. Uh, a third key policy initiative for us is the AIM for Climate. The uh, Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate is uh, another, is a, in, in a, an initiative that the United States launched along with the UAE, and it was rolled out uh, through the UN Food System Summit and at COP26 last year. It works to close the investment gap and to increase collaboration across government and non-government partners in support of innovations that support climate smart agricultural and food systems. So those are big words for us, climate smart agriculture and food systems. To date, five AU countries have joined the aim for climate, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, and Mozambique. And over nine organizations based in Africa from the public sector have joined the initiative as knowledge partners. So uh, those high, high uh, headline initiatives we have, the School Feeding Coalition, the Sustainable Productivity Growth Coalition, the Agricultural Innovation Mission for Climate. Uh, these things are also supporting other discrete activities that USDA is working on. For example, we have a workshop uh, being developed uh, in the African region between the African Union and Iowa State University under the Africa Seed and Biotechnology Program to enhance seed systems and biotechnology product deployment on the continent. This workshop is expected to happen at the end of this year or early next year. Additionally, we think that adopting global food safety best practices improve public health and provide greater market access both things together. These things can further economic development, improve nutrition and health outcomes, and help integrate the African continent. Uh, this is, therefore, we commend the African Union's development of the SPS policy framework uh, to serve as an instrument to help regional economic communities and member states harmonize and strengthen their sanitary and phytosanitary systems, SPS. So I'll just wrap up here by saying uh, we've got great programmatic activities in the region. We're involved in high level policy discussions that really get to the core of sustainable food systems. And these things are becoming, the importance of them is highlighted by crises, uh, like the ones that we're in, engaged with now on climate and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And one of the things that we know is that uh, moving food from surplus regions to deficit regions is critical to feeding the planet. And so trade, which is the movement across borders of food and food products, uh, can help combat hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. You know, since the end of World War II, the global population has grown by over 5 billion people. At the same time, the share of people living under extreme poverty, the share, the number of people, or the share of all this total population, over 7 billion now, has fallen from maybe 80% to 20%. And core to that has been the work of international organizations and institutions that have promoted economic growth and the movement of food across borders through rules-based market-oriented systems. So we commend African country commitments to this ideal through the Malibu Declaration and the African Continental Free Trade Area. Uh, we look forward to working with African countries in the WTO and in other international organizations. And we are pleased to partner with African 
partners to ensure support for liberalized agricultural trade, including two-way trade with the United States to meet Africa's growing food and nutrition demands and create opportunities for African farmers. So USDA is part of the global food security strategy and feed the future in, in the US government. And so uh, we welcome working with our African partners to share best practices to improve food security and nutritional outcomes on the continent. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Mr. Afmeister. I would like to thank both um, Her Excellence uh, Commissioner Samate and Mr. Hafmeister for your very rich remarks uh, on the topic of nutrition. Uh, Commissioner Samate did uh, um, emphasize, did highlight Africa's six priorities to boost nutrition, having given a very cogent um, uh, picture of the status of uh, malnutrition uh, on the continent. High emphasis was basically on uh, improving data management, investment in nutrition, enhancing partnerships, improving accountability using the continental scorecard, and advancing the nutrition agenda on the continent. Very key priorities for, um, for Africa. And Mr. Halfmeister um, made a strong case especially for the school feeding programs and its benefits to improving the health of children and also learning uh, outcomes, as well as boosting local economies um, through uh, consumption of locally produced food. And also promoting institutional development, especially for Africa's agricultural research systems through, uh, for example, Academia 2063, FARA, Reform, and so on. And the emphasis on climate change, um, the SPS policy framework for Africa, and finally, uh, the importance of uh, boosting trade uh, to ensure that food moves from um, deficit, from surplus areas to um, uh, food deficit areas to uh, boost food, uh, food, food consumption and food security, uh, promoting the benefits of the Africa continental free trade area and also uh, the comprehensive Africa culture development program. So thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Samate and Mr. Halfmeister. Now, over the next um, uh, 15 or so minutes, we are opening up the, uh, the discussion to the audience and we welcome uh, questions that are posed to uh, the two speakers. So the first question that, that we have um, is, that some religions, for instance, are encouraging their followers not to eat some food items like beef, um, which we know is important for nutrition within our diets. So how would you address this? Okay, um, uh, about religious uh, forbidden our you, you can find in Africa, for example, I remember when I was a child, they said we cannot eat eggs. Uh, what can we do for that? Uh, we work with uh, women and uh, to sensitize them on the necessity to give uh, eggs to children and also to sensitize these uh, uh, religious people that is not, uh, it's for the benefit of health and they can see malnutrition children when they see the difference between children nourished with uh, all kind of food and the one they forbid, they realize that they are, they, they are not doing well and they can see when they lost one, two, three children, they realize that is not a good idea, but uh, uh, they try to change. We are working with them at the community le level and also our member state. And also uh, at national level, we have uh, in many countries, the ministry in charge of all these questions and uh, working with uh, uh, clinics, hospital to sensitize uh, our citizen and also young, especially young generation to tell them that, that uh, there is no food forbid for anybody uh, based on the religion. Yes, uh, we, you have pork for uh, Muslim, but uh, only pork cannot uh, uh, be a, a problem for, uh, for anybody. If you have another meat, not only pork meat, but it can be fine. 
Uh, you are right, but we are working on, on that situation in collaboration with our institutions and local, especially local communities. Is that what I can say? Thank you, Commissioner Samate. Mr. Afmeister? Did you, yes, go ahead, uh, Mr. Afmeister. Yeah, I'll just make a, a general comment, which is, our perspective is really to give freedom of choice to consumers, that we are doing our job correctly if there is availability of a broad diversity of food supplies to a consumer who may, for whatever reason, maybe taste, it may be ethics, would want to choose a, a particular type of, of uh, diet to follow, that, uh, that, that we want to empower the consumers to make those decisions. And so key to providing this variety and this sufficiency of food is both production. How can we encourage local producers to find the best way to produce on their agricultural land and then the flow of goods? How can we ensure that there is availability of imports uh, that will allow consumers to make a choice? And so, you know, meat products are a very delicate topic. We see very high need and demand for animal protein. Uh, there are people who have concerns about uh, animal protein, but that means that we have to work even harder to find other forms of protein for those people. And so we think both uh, improved productivity and open borders are the way to do that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Afmeister. <clears throat> we have another question. Clear and strong strategies and policies have been outlined by the African Union to promote nutrition. However, some countries are not implementing. What can be done to hold countries accountable to implementation? I guess this is to um, Commissioner Samati. Uh, thank you very much. We have uh, many strategies. I mentioned the Malabo Declaration and we have our strategy on nutrition and uh, we are working to promote uh, th this is not critical uh, uh, political issues, the issue of nutrition. And uh, our member states realized that having a strategies, many strategies, uh, not enough. And that's why they have uh, this uh, year 2022 on nutrition. And uh, with a roadmap, and a roadmap uh, to be implemented at uh, national level, African Union Commission, our uh, regional communities uh, to implement and uh, to work to, to uh, how do you call that? We have many challenges to, to, to try to find a solution on nutrition. And um, my predecessor, I like something. We have food in Africa, but how this food can be uh, delivered, that uh, another issue. And I, uh, what Josepha said, uh, to complement that one, we need to work with our farmers. Uh, we have all kinds of food, but sometimes they don't, don't know how to cook them or how to uh, give to our children. And uh, we have strategy, we are working on that, that, but how to implement. We don't have guns to say, to tell our member said, please, uh, you have to implement uh, 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 our strategy. Uh, we are working based on sensitization. And uh, now we have um, our regional communities. They are, the they eight uh, uh, regional communities are the pillars of African Union. They will uh, also implement at the level of regional communities than at national uh, 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 level. Uh, we cannot force them, but this question is uh, very important. We, we cannot have the Africa we want without, uh, uh, with uh, malnutrished population. We have uh, more than 77% of our population, they are young. If they are not healthy, if they are not eating well, we cannot build the Africa we want with peace, security, stability, and uh, contributing to the development of Africa. We are working on based on sensitization and uh, uh, to, to encourage them. And uh, we have our 
uh, uh, working with them. We have our STCs, uh, technical community at ministerial level with a specific minister to say, are, where are we? At the level of implementation of our strategies, we have uh, our STCs. We are working with them. We are going to have a, a meeting with them uh, in Malabo. We will have uh, before the end of year to say, where are we? What can be done? And uh, uh, they are all committed. Uh, when I say our member said they are all committed to implement our strategies, especially on nutrition uh, and uh, agriculture. Uh, the crisis with uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, show us the necessity to count on ourselves to grow, to, to have, a, we have our, how do you say that one, that a CADEP in, Fran in French. We need to implement, <laughs> we need to implement that one on agriculture and uh, to go with um, infrastructure because we have in some countries, we have food, but how to bring this food uh, to the, uh, the country that a, a, a another play, uh, problem, but we don't have many problem uh, uh, seeing countries uh, refusing to implement what we have as strategies of uh, uh, legal instrument, but uh, especially on nutrition, we don't face too much of this kind of problem. We are continuing our work naturally with the Department of uh, Agriculture uh, with Joseph Asako, and not only Joseph Asako, we have the issue of young youth with uh, Commissioner Belusin that uh, we don't have, we don't face many challenges uh, to see our strategy being implemented. But we need also, I insist on finance issues. If we don't have finance to implement our strategies, this is another problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions and that will close this session. Uh, the first one I will address it to Mr. Hafmeister. Do US, do U.S. and AU see a role for the private sector in investing in nutrition? If so, how can this be encouraged? Yes, thank you for the question. And certainly the answer is yes. We know that as governments, we lack sufficient resources to care for all of the nutrition needs uh, in our countries or in others. And we know that the dynamism and the resources of the private sector are required to do that. So how do we encourage more investment in the sector? And the maybe two ways, there are two ways to think about this is that one, we are very interested in seeing more sustainable production at the farm and the processor level. How can we encourage our producers to grow more on a smaller environmental footprint? And then second, how can we encourage the food providers to have the most nutritious food available to consumers? So the consistent theme between both of these uh, for us is back to the market-oriented rules-based system. You know, if the global market is big enough, uh, it will be enticing enough to investors to make invest to put in their money to develop new technologies uh, to invest in increasing production uh, because they will see a return and those entrepreneurs will only make those investments if they have customers at the farm level or in the company and those farmers and those companies are only going to make the purchases of new technologies that innovators will come up with if they have a big enough market to sell into. So we know that uh, we need to have regional and global markets available to encourage producers to step up their game to find better ways to increase the production. And similarly, we know that we need a regulatory framework that is going to encourage the healthiest food possible. And this regulatory framework really needs to be science-based and data-driven. And so uh, these two things go hand in hand. We know that developing new technologies that are gonna increase production uh, requires open markets and a sound science-based regulatory regime. And we know that the guidance that producers need to, uh, is going to be through these evidence-based regulatory procedures. 
that are supported by global institutions like the Codex. So okay. that, that's really where we see the, the overlap. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Halfmeister. So I uh, have run out, unfortunately, of time to, to get into some additional questions that I, um, that I can see. Uh, the, our colleagues will make them available to the speakers and we can request the speakers to um, respond to them uh, so that the answers can be passed on to the audience. So with that, I would like to uh, sincerely thank uh, High Excellence Ambassador Samati and also Mr. Halfmeister for your uh, statements, but also for taking time to uh, respond to the question that were uh, posed. With that, I hand back to the moderator. Thank you so much for uh, your indulgence. Uh, thank you uh, to uh, Godfrey Behigwa. Thank you, uh, Director, for your uh, outstanding uh, leadership on this panel. I want to thank you for your vision and direct assistment, assistment, assistance uh, in working together with us on this key engagement that flows out of the USAU high-level dialogue uh, that met in March. I also want to thank um, direct, uh, Dr. Mayangwa and the ubiquitous Wilson Center team for helping this event long in planning to become a reality. And thank, I'm just very, very thankful from the Department of State's perspective and the, the newly appointed uh, Global Food Security Envoy. Uh, for the next presentation, we turn to a critical player in the US government, the US Congress. And uh, Senator Von Hollen uh, will be providing pre-recorded remarks um, uh, as of the chair of the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Subcommittee on Africa and Global Health Policy. Uh, he, he will be providing his views on how the current cri crisis uh, can be uh, mitigated, as well as insights on how a unified Capitol Hill is looking to support Africa's food security and nutrition efforts. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hull, and I'm proud to represent Maryland in the United States Senate. And I'm honored to join members of the Wilson Center and all of your partners for this important conversation on the crisis of food insecurity in Africa. We know that access to affordable, healthy food is critical to every human being in every community. When families have access to nutritious food, they have an opportunity to thrive. But when food is scarce, inaccessible, or unaffordable, people suffer. That's true in our neighborhoods and towns across the United States, and that's true every place around the world. And we know that right now, Nations across Africa are facing an emergency situation when it comes to food insecurity. The root causes of this crisis come from multiple directions. The COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted supply chains around the world, driving up the cost of food. The climate crisis has resulted in harmful droughts that have upended the agriculture sector, particularly in East Africa. Conflicts in Ethiopia, the Sahel, and other places on the continent threaten food production and supply lines. Putin's brutal war in Ukraine has shaken the global economy, including the global food export market. Ukraine is the third largest exporter of wheat in the world, with almost 10% of the global wheat market. Together, all of these factors add mounting pressure to an already unbearable situation. And the nations along the Horn of Africa and in the Sahel have been especially hard hit. As the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on Africa and Global Health Policy, I'm deeply committed to working with my colleagues in Congress to address this crisis. The stakes are too high for us to sit this one out. As President Biden has said many times, America is strongest when we lead, not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. Now is a moment for us to do what we can to help people around the world make it through this difficult time. It's not only the morally right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do so we can get the global economy back on track and improve stability and security in the region. In today's interconnected world, an ongoing crisis in one country can affect every other country. And we must work with our partners in the international community to address these threats together. I'm glad that President
President Biden has called on Congress to pass a $33 billion supplemental funding bill to respond to the crisis in Ukraine. And that funding package includes additional funds to strengthen food security around the world. And I'm pushing to boost that support still further. Those resources will help provide wheat and other commodities to people in need and bolster countries' resilience to shocks in global food supplies and prices. Top humanitarian organizations around the world are calling for approximately $5 billion in aid to address the global crisis in food insecurity. And I agree with them. I'm working now to increase the amount of food aid in the final supplemental package to a level that, it's cons that is consistent with the vision articulated by the Biden administration. I'm also continuing to partner with Senator Mike Reynolds, who serves with me as the ranking member of the Africa Subcommittee to strengthen the ties that bind the United States with our partners in Africa so we can super supercharge trade with and investment in African nations and lay the groundwork for more resilient food markets and economies in the region. And I'm committed to drawing upon the knowledge, experience, and brain power at the Wilson Center and at your peer institutions to chart a future course of security, resilience, health, and prosperity for all. It's in that spirit that I'd like to end where I began. Thank you for organizing this important and very timely conversation on the crisis of food insecurity. And I commend you for your leadership on this and so many other issues. Together, I know we can end hunger around the world and build a brighter future for all of our communities. Thank you for what you do. Uh, we, we at State Department, um, and speaking possibly for the rest of the U.S. interagency here gathered, are thankful for the vision and support of the U.S. Congress as we together seek to bolster African-led food security and nutrition efforts, and to move this strategy forward in implementing plans as well. Uh, now, uh, for the last, very most difficult task of summarizing this entire conversation, uh, we have selected one of our most capable senior foreign service officers at the Department of State, Ambassador Jesse LePen. She has served as our ambassador to the African Union since two, August of 2019, and helped to develop several key sectors of work with the African Union uh, during the most challenged time with both COVID and now the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I turn it over now to Ambassador Penn for the most difficult task. Thank you for summarizing uh, this event. You. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. It's good. You, you framed my task as difficult, which of course makes it now easier. Um, so I, I thank you for that. Um, first morning to colleagues in Washington. Good afternoon to colleagues uh, in, in Africa. Um, look, I'll, I'll pick up where Senator Van Hollen left off, which is the importance and the timeliness of this conversation. This is the moment to be having it, given the way the risk to food security and to nutrition has been heightened by COVID, by inflation, by Russian aggression in Ukraine, by climate, um, by certainly where I'm sitting in the Horn of Africa, um, by drought, um, and so it is particularly timely at this moment, which is worth noting because, um, as Mike indicated, this conversation has been a long time in coming. We really wanted to have these people at this table. And so um, this is the moment to do it. Um, what, what Dr. Fowler didn't notice, he's in fact just joined the State Department team um, again, making it particularly timely. So I, I thank Ambassador Green and the Wilson Center platform for, for enabling this. So for me, a, a note of thanks before I summarize, and that's to say as ambassador to the AU, I have the privilege of working with extraordinary African colleagues um, day in, day out. And so I'm really very glad that um, a Washington audience had the chance to hear directly from Commissioner Sacco, from Commissioner Smate and from Dr. Godfrey. What you heard from them is, is really important because it is, it is their insight, their commitment. And I, I love Dr. Fowler's question, sort of what are those of us not on the ground not know? So really, on me sur la commissariat, je dis merci and also obrigado. Really, I, I thank you both for joining us. Um, 
So what I'd like to do in response to Mike's task is take a couple minutes to do a recap um, of each of the sessions, but given the, the excellent recaps that the, the moderators also did as we went along, I, I think I'll also then come back to what I heard as some of the do outs. Um, and I say that because I actually think there was a wonderful alignment around both problem definition and problem solution. So therefore leaving with some sense of, so what do we do next? Where do we, we take this forward? Um, so in our first session on, on food security, we heard from Commissioner Sacco and, and Dr. Barnhart. And for me, one of the key takeaways that was hugely important was, was the alignment, was actually the sense of warmth and connectivity that, that came across many, many miles um, and, and many screens. I think from the AU perspective, there was a real focus on creating resilient food systems, food systems that will withstand current and future shocks, um, a focus on reducing post-harvest loss, promoting intra-African trade, which includes food safety and standards, um, all in order for the continent to be able to grow enough food to feed its own people. Um, there, was, there was really important interest coming from Commissioner Sacco about um, how do we engage science? How do we engage the private sector? Um, and also, I think a really exciting discussion about what is the role of youth in this sector? Um, and then a couple of key takeaways that I don't want to get lost that, that Jim noted is the extraordinary US commitment um, going forward. So what I heard from Commissioner Sacco was really a description of a, of a historical and ongoing commitment uh, from the U.S., from USAID, from USDA. And then Jim really described the U.S. intention to double down with $5 billion over five years for Feed the Future and up to $11 billion over three years on nutrition. In the second session um, on nutrition, uh, we heard from Commissioner Santmate really a compelling picture of malnutrition, of the needs on the continent, and, a, and an answer that includes one, good data, that you need the right data to make the right decisions. And you also need mobilization of domestic resources, as well as accountability through scorecards. Um, I was really, really struck by Mr. Hoffmeister's description of programs, because what ran through all of them for me was the focus on collaboration. In no program was he saying, the US is doing this, in every program, it is what are we doing and with whom? And I was struck by how those programs operate across countries, across regions, and across sectors, bringing in non-governmental organizations, universities, and private sector. Um, they took on a question around um, religious or cultural practice. And I think the commissioner zoned in immediately on the importance of community level work particularly the mobilization of women for anything in the nutrition space, because this is at the, at the family and at the household level that certain mobilization needs to be done. Um, they also looked at, again, the question of the private sector, what's its role, and, and talked about market-oriented rules-based system as being part of the solution. So against this background of, of alignment, I call out a couple of next steps that, that I heard through this discussion that I think were particularly important. Um, the first next step at a, at a political level is, is upcoming in New York over the next week. Um, as the U.S. chairs the U.N. Security Council uh, this month, um, there will be several events. One, a Security Council event chaired by the Secretary of State that is devoted to the issue of food security. And then the secretary will, will host a ministerial in New York with more than 30 other ministers, not only from Africa, 30 other ministers to look at this issue. Um, so for me, that is a, is a next step that, that was referenced. Um, the next was AU intention to create a food safety agency. And Commissioner Sacco proposed um, an exchange with the FDA so I promise, um, I promise uh, Dr. Godfrey, please let the commissioner know that, that the USAU team has taken note and we will follow up with her. Um, I think that 
the emphasis that she described on operationalizing uh, food safety, following the, her discussion and, and that of others today about the frameworks that the U.S. and the AU have reached together on food safety issues. Um, that's a really exciting next step. Um, another next step that I heard a lot of emphasis on was investments in research, in top quality research, uh, both for agriculture, but specifically the connectivity for agriculture and climate change. Um, so a sense that we're doing a lot, but actually we need to do more. Um, there was also a discussion around um, the need for more investment in extension services including for making fertilizer more efficient specifically, but also more broadly, extension services. Um, focus on, on management of post-harvest food loss, but this is a critical space. Um, I very much appreciated uh, the discussion around accelerating commitments under the Malibu Declaration and using biennial data to make good decisions. Again, this theme of what is the data? How do we get the data? And how do we use the data? Um, there was an agreement that looking forward, we need to have youth involved. And then on private sector involvement and how, how do we do that in both food security and nutrition? Um, finally, uh, the last next steps, which I, which I referenced in my summary of the second session are really how to strengthen data management and systems for nutrition and then how to mobilize domestic resources for nutrition. Um, I, I think this was, was really a, a terrific conversation. And of course, although long planned, it comes today in the context of the AU's year of nutrition. And the full title of that year matters because it is, it is the year of nutrition strengthening resilience in nutrition and food security. And I underscore that because I think it's important to understand how the AU is looking at it. It's not just food security, it is food security and nutrition, both of which are particularly challenged, again, in this moment, given climate-related impacts, Russian aggression in Ukraine, um, making all of the challenges that we envisioned when we first talked about this panel last year all the more, all the more um, critical. And, and what's important to me about the AU's year is that one, they, they identified it before we were in this particular moment of acute crisis. And two, we all, everyone um, on the, these panels today and in our audience today know that, that this isn't a one year project, that what we're talking about is over the long term resilience to current and future shocks. This is a long-term set of systemic issues. Um, but what the AU has done is they have created a framework. They have, they, they, you need the agreement of all the heads of state in deciding the theme of the year, which means that this theme of the year represents a significant head of state AU political commitment. And it also creates a framework for the rest of us outside of the AU to join them in partnership, to follow their lead in addressing these critical problems. And I think um, today's conversation, which has brought the extraordinary USAU relationship into, um, into full visibility, has brought it into the broader Washington conversation, I think is, is really important, really exciting, um, and, and that there is lots of work to do moving forward and um, clearly a lot of enthusiasm and energy to do just that. Um, so with that, I, I thank everyone and, and I, I think it is to me to close off. Um, but let me confirm uh, from Dr. Mondi that that's the case and maybe turn it back to her. Oh my gosh, Ambassador Lepin, thank you so much. What a powerful and on point um, conclusion highlighting all the key issues uh, that had been uh, raised by our speakers highlighting what the AU and uh, the US government are working on together, highlighting the opportunities um, and the priorities for the way forward. I thought you just hit the nail on the head in terms of all the key points. I'm so glad we were able to get you online all the way from Djibouti. So thank you so much 
uh, for making the time and for giving us this really powerful conclusion on key points, but also you know, identifying the key nodes for the way forward in terms of how we work together. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, all that remains for me is really just to say on behalf of the African Union Commission, uh, the Department of State and the Wilson Center, I want to thank all of the participants uh, for joining us on this very, very important uh, discussion on Africa's policy priorities for food security and nutrition. I also want to take a moment and thank each of our speakers who tuned in today. The very high level um, participation and um, in this uh, event says a lot about where we are. All of you are busy people and the fact that you were able to find the time to join in for this discussion, to really frame the discussion, put your analysis and thoughts out there, set out your strategic priorities and talk through, you know, how we can work together means uh, a lot to us. And that it also demonstrates how much the African continent through the AU and the US government are vested in strengthening both food security and nutrition in our partnership. And so to Ambassador Green, Ambassador McCain, uh, Commissioner Sacco, Dr. Bernhardt, Dr. Fowler, uh, Commissioner Samate, Dr. Bahigua, Mr. Hafmeister, Ambassador Le Pen, Mr. Bittrick, and the Africa program team, as well as all of the staff at the Department of State, the African Union, um, the team in Rome and over USA, USAID, we, we thank you uh, for making uh, this uh, possible. We will have a summary of the event and the video sometime next week so we can continue to uh, engage, but more importantly, we look forward to following up on many of the issues that Ambassador Le Pen uh, just laid out for us in terms of the areas of confluence and alignment that we can now follow up on uh, to build on. So thank you so much uh, to everyone, our speakers, our participants, and the teams that have made this event uh, possible. And with that, we will sign off and we look forward to continuing uh, the discussion and the collaboration. Thank you.